Hello, and welcome back to The Crime Reel. For today's true crime narration, we shall be looking at the recent events relating to the 1984 murder of Christine Jessup and how developments in the science of DNA and genetic genealogy testing have led to her killer being identified 36 years after the crime. In 1984, Christine Jessup was nine years old and was living with her mother, Janet, and her older brother, 14-year-old Kenny. They lived in the quiet rural community of Queensville, Ontario, in Canada. She was described as a happy-go-lucky young girl who loved animals and sports. At that time, Christine's father, Robert, was being held in custody at a detention centre after he had been charged with misappropriation of company funds. Very few people knew of the family's legal troubles, and on 3rd of October 1984, Janet and Kenny were making a trip to the detention centre to visit Robert. As Christine was only nine years old at the time, Janet felt that she was too young to go on the visit with them. Christine attended school, then returned home on the bus as normal that day. After getting off of the bus, she went into the nearby convenience store to buy some bubble gum before heading home to the empty house. Christine had arranged to meet her friend Leslie at the playground at 4pm that evening, but she never arrived. When Janet and Kenny returned home from their visit, they were surprised to find Christine's bike carelessly abandoned by their front door. This was very out of character for Christine who loved her bike and took very good care of it. Her coat was hanging on a hook which was out of Christine's reach and Christine was nowhere to be found. After realising that Christine was not in the house, Janet contacted friends and neighbours in an attempt to find out where her daughter was. The police were notified at around 7pm that evening and an investigation into the disappearance was soon underway led by the York Regional Police. It would be almost three months later on 31st of December 1984 that Christine's family received the devastating news that Christine's body had been found by a man out walking with his two young daughters. The partially decomposed body, which had to be identified by dental records, had been found in a rural area approximately 35 miles away from the family's home. Christine had been brutally beaten and sexually assaulted. The cause of death was established as stab wounds to the chest. The following day, the investigation was taken over by the Durham Police Department. Christine was buried on the 7th of January 1985, at which point the police were investigating numerous leads, but were yet to identify a strong suspect in Christine's murder. However, in mid-February 1985, the police became interested in a man by the name of Guy Paul Moran. Guy lived with his parents next door to the Jessup family, with some reports stating that they were quite a strange family, with Guy being described as odd. The police became convinced that Guy was the one responsible for Christine's death, and the investigation continued on the basis of proving Guy's guilt. On 22nd of April 1985, Guy was arrested and charged with Christine's murder. He protested his innocence, and exactly a year after Christine was laid to rest, the trial began. It lasted approximately four weeks, during which time many inconsistencies and inaccuracies in the Crown's case were highlighted by Guy's defence team. The timeline between Guy's day and when Janet and Kenny discovered Christine was missing did not add up. There simply wasn't enough time for Guy to have committed the murder. A witness who had heard screams in the vicinity of the area where Christine was found was ignored despite this corroborating Guy's timeline. Key evidence had gone missing and procedures were not followed. A hair found at the crime scene was similar to Guy's and provided no conclusive evidence and fibres found could easily be explained by the proximity of the two families' homes. The prosecution presented two witnesses who both claimed to have heard Guy confessing to the crime whilst in prison. These two men both received some form of deal in exchange for their testimony. On February the 7th, 1986, after the jury had deliberated for around 13 hours, Guy was found. 
not guilty of Christine's murder. However, Guy's ordeal was far from over. The Crown exercised its right to appeal the verdict. The appeal was made on the grounds that the trial judge had made a fundamental error in the instructions given to the jury. The Ontario Court of Appeal ordered a new trial. Guy appealed against this, but the decision was upheld. Four years after Guy's acquittal, the new trial began on 28th of May 1990. Christine's body was exhumed and it was found that key details were missing during the first autopsy. It was also established that small bones found by Kenny during a visit to the site where Christine had been found definitely belonged to Christine and had been missed at the time of the original search of the area. The second trial lasted far longer. However, the cases put forward by both the prosecution and defence were fundamentally the same as the first trial. The two inmates who claimed to have witnessed Guy's confession were given more credibility at the second trial as it was made clear that they had, this time, agreed to testify voluntarily rather than as part of a deal from which they would benefit. In addition, during this trial it came to light that Christine's brother Kenny, along with two other boys, had been having sex with each other and with Christine from when she was five years old until her death. This would have taken place when Kenny was between 10 and 14 years old and he has stated that he was also a victim of abuse at the hands of the two other boys, one of whom was much older at the time. Due to this information, Kenny did become a suspect at one point of the investigation but was cleared of any involvement. At the end of July 1992, the trial came to a close. A unanimous verdict of guilty of first degree murder was read out to the shock of many of those involved. Guy was sentenced to life in prison. Unlike others convicted of sexually assaulting and murdering children, Guy was kept in the general population at Kingston Penitentiary during his time in prison. Guy appealed his conviction and, in an unusual move, was released on bond on the 10th of February 1993 whilst awaiting the outcome of this appeal. Less than two years later, in January 1995, as the new trial date was approaching, changes to the DNA techniques used were able to conclusively rule out Guy's involvement in the crime. After 10 years of living in limbo, Guy could finally move on with his life. The problems with this case and conviction led to significant changes of how police investigated murders in Canada. It was by now 10 years since Christine's murder and it was once again an unsolved case. In February 1995, the investigation was transferred to the Toronto Police Department, where it would take another 25 years for them to reach any kind of closure. On 15th of October 2020, the police named the man responsible for Christine's death, following an investigation which had lasted over 35 years. It was announced that investigators had contacted a genetic laboratory in Texas. This laboratory works exclusively with law enforcement to help to provide leads and identify subjects through DNA. A technique known as genetic genealogy was used. This is where a possible family tree can be constructed from a DNA sample. This technique does not come up with an individual suspect, but gives a potential family lineage which can be used to point investigators in a certain direction, enabling them to then use traditional techniques to ascertain someone's innocence or guilt. By using a semen sample found at the scene of the crime, the police were able to identify a strong suspect, a man by the name of Calvin Hoover. Calvin had been 28 at the time of Christine's murder. He was married to a lady named Heather, who worked with Christine's father, Robert. The two families were known to have socialised together, and Heather was one of the few people who was aware of Robert's legal troubles. Heather, and therefore possibly Calvin, were aware that Janet and Kenny would be visiting Robert that day, and that Christine would be alone. After Christine's disappearance, Calvin joined a search to try to find her. Together with his wife, they attended Christine's funeral and the wake. Calvin took his own life in 2015. Blood from the autopsy was compared to the DNA found at the crime scene and was found to be a match. 
If Calvin was still alive today, he would be charged with Christine's murder. Calvin had a completely unrelated criminal history at the time of Christine's murder and was not connected to any other crimes before his death in 2015. However, it would lead us to question whether someone who had committed such a violent and brutal murder would possibly have done so as a one-off event. Guy has a surprising lack of bitterness towards the legal system which failed him. His family had to mortgage their house and spent all of their money to provide him with the best possible legal representation. A public inquiry was ordered in June 1998 and seven months later he was awarded compensation of 1.25 million Canadian dollars. When he was told of the killer finally being identified, he said, I am grateful that the Toronto police stayed on the case and have now finally solved it. When DNA exonerated me in January 1995, I was sure that one day DNA would reveal the real killer and now it has. For the Jessup family, they will finally have some closure knowing who had taken the life of Christine, but will now have to deal with the frustration of never seeing that person brought to justice. That concludes today's story. Thanks very much to Amy's Watching the Stars and Marion Bowler who told me about this old case that finally had some closure. Please add any comments down below. And now it's time for Petty Crime. Merciless Martian from East Tennessee has sent in pictures of Luna Dog. Luna was originally owned by Merciless Martian's niece, who works in the US Navy, and then she was deployed. So Merciless Martian gained a wonderful dog. She plays hide and seek. She loves catching her ball. And is also a bed snuggler. Merciless Martian only has 30 minutes in the mornings and will no doubt be drinking her macchiato this morning. Her seven year old has written a poem. And I'll leave you with this. Luna, you're a tick. Luna, you're a tick. A lunatic and I love you. I love you because you're crazy. Next we have Denise from Northern Colorado. She has sent in pictures mainly of Izzy and Unicorn Sparkles appears in one of the photos. Izzy will always be Denise's angel. Izzy escaped from the back garden on the evening on 21st of January 2018. So she escaped that night and has sadly been missing ever since. To anyone in Northern Colorado that may have seen her, please make contact here or to Denise. Just for info, Izzy would turn five in February. And finally, we have Lola. Lola was adopted from a rescue shelter near Redditch. She's a very affectionate young lady. And she loves being petted. Sadly, her petty crime is to dribble profusely and then roll around in it. Jess, the owner, is allergic to Lola and has to take three types of antihistamines a day. But in Jess's words, she is worth it. Jess is from a place in England that not many people know how to say unless you're English. It's spelled W-O-R-C-E-S-T-E-R and it's Worcester. And you may have heard of their sauce, Worcestershire sauce. That concludes today's petty crime. Thanks to everyone that sent the pictures in. Thanks very much for listening to the crime reel. Stay safe. Goodbye. This genetic genealogy was used in another case that I've featured recently. It's the case of Jay Cook and Tanya Van Kulenberg. There will be a link at the end of the video and I'll put a link in the description if you want to go and see that one. Goodbye.